We really owe a big uh, thanks to all of our fund holders, all of the advisors that work with us throughout the year. We really appreciate your support, your referrals. You are fantastic ambassadors for us and uh, led us to a record-breaking year. Uh, we're excited to say we're about to hit 4,000 funds that we manage for over $2 billion. And we were able to, <laughs> more importantly, we were able to give out $435 million this year to charities, thousands and thousands of charities in every sector. And one of the things that I love personally about the Donor Advice Fund and about being at JCF is that it makes it so easy and so quick and efficient for people to support their charities and increase their impact. And we see this year in and year out. So please think of us for your own philanthropy, for your clients. We're happy to help you. It's a fabulous online platform because we're not uh, associated with a commercial institution. It's a very unbiased platform. Uh, in the private client group, of course, we vet managers that aren't currently on the platform. We take all kinds of assets, whatever your clients happen to have, offshore, onshore, real property, doesn't matter. We can help them convert that into philanthropic capital so that they can really increase their capacity and achieve their vision in terms of helping society. Um, today, we wanted to focus on a topic that I hear come up all the time, not just in the family office roundtable that we do with Pick Karen. I think I saw Andrew pop in here, um, and many of the uh, meetings that we attend with New York State Society CPAs and their family office group. And, and what I hear from our own clients concerns about trusteeship both on the family side and on terms of serving, whether it's on a foundation, on a public charity board. There's just a lot to be considered, and people often enter into things without knowing what they're getting into. So today, our speakers are really going to help us take a, a, a deep dive into that. Oh, and I didn't introduce myself. For those who don't know me, <laughs> Everyone knows me, so good. Ellen Israelson. Um, I, I want to thank uh, EMM Wealth and Drinker Biddle for being so generous with their time and support and lending us two of their experts today. Uh, I think you're really in for a, a great experience. Uh, we have with us Susan Hartley Moss, Senior Wealth and Fiduciary Advisor and Senior Vice President from EMM Wealth, and <clears throat> Andrew Grumet, Partner at Drinker Biddle. OK, Susan, I think I'm going to kick off and start with you. Um, oh, it is live. Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> I okay. know. It doesn't sound they like They turned it on. It is. All right. Um, <laughs> Actually, before the first question, maybe you'll just say a couple words about your role at EMM and, and the type of people you work with there. Just give us a, a little bit more background. Uh, my role at EMM is, um, if you will, director of fiduciary. So um, I, I help clients with the, you know, anything from the planning aspects. We don't draft. Um, we're not a law firm. We're an investment advisory firm, but we. We also provide financial planning, estate planning, but what I do specifically is help clients in the trust and estate administration of their trusts um, and guide them um, in, in the proper administration of their trusts and settling estates, settling the trusts if, there's a, if they are settling them and distributing them, but oftentimes these trusts last for years and years and years. Um, so I'm, I'm their eyes and ears. I'm, the, I'm hopefully the, their sleep well at night. <laughs> Um, and uh, that's, that's my role, and then I oftentimes get involved in the planning phase before we're actually executing. That's always the best thing to be involved with on the, on the pre-planning before we actually have to execute the documents. That's kind of it in a nutshell. Excellent. Um, so what do you need to know before you become a trustee? Tell us a little more about the responsibilities, what this entails. 
So uh, I'll start off by saying that you know acting in a individual, acting as a trustee, particularly in an individual capacity, carries with it tremendous liability and responsibility. And a lot of people get into that role without really um, appreciating the work that they're going to have to do and that they have personal liability. What do I mean by that? It means if there's a, a it means that the, if there's an action or a judgment against you that you know, the, the, to defend yourself, uh, it's potentially that, potential that you're going to have to pay for those legal expenses out of your own bank account. And if the judgment is successful against you, that the beneficiaries could reach into your um, personal assets. And a lot of people don't really understand that. Um, you know, they get into the role, um, you know, they, they might think it's an honor. And while it is, an honor, there comes with it significant responsibility and liability. Um, and uh, the, and I think that, you know, managing, it's really about managing risk as well. Um, so they need to know, and then there's specifics, and I don't know if you want me to go into that, of what you really need to do yeah, before. Please. So it's sort of philosophically, you need to know there's tremendous, there's, this is its own job. This is not side of desk. Like it, you know, this is a this is depending on how many trusts you're managing for the family, let's say. It it usually people have their day job and then they're also trustee. And there's that they have to know that 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 job is a profession. And there are people like myself that uh, attorneys that and the CPAs that you know help people and the guy in guiding them, but that that is its own. It's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot of work. Um, so, the I would say before now before you even get into the role. So let's say you're named in a document. Um, being named being named in a document doesn't mean you've ex necessarily accepted the role. Okay, you accept when you sign accepting the role. You could be named um, as executor or executrix. You could be named as a trustee. If you've accepted the role, then you're in. Um, I would say before you actually accept the role, there's a couple of things you really should do. Um, first of all, you should understand your, your rights and responsibilities as a trustee. Um, and if you don't understand your rights and responsibilities, uh, then you should have good guidance um, and, you know, either from a good trust and estate lawyer uh, or um, um, someone like, you know, EMM does this kind of work. We guide trustees, but we, again, we don't practice law, so we'd probably, if there was no trust and estate lawyer we, or, or CPA, we put a team together. But, you have to really understand there are rights and responsibilities broader than the governing instrument, broader than the trust document itself. Um, and so first thing is understanding all the trust documents um, and, sure, and ensuring you have the ability to actually administer the assets, um, either directly or through the use of advisors. Um, I, I teach this course in a couple of places um, called Duties and Powers of a Trustee. And um, my students hear me say all the time, you know, read the entire document, read the entire document. In law school, we say read the four corners of the document. And I can't tell you how many people come to me and say, but I'm page 20. This is where it is. This is the discretionary distribution. But I can guarantee you that on page 25, there's going to be more information to give you regarding the treatment of beneficiaries or the treatment of the assets of the trust. So read the entire document from beginning to end. Um, don't rely on your lawyer to read it. I would say to my client, don't even rely on me to read it. You know, it's amazing how many uh, the lawyers in the room may, may or may not agree with me on this. I love doing this with my, the, the people in my office. I give the same document to four different lawyers. They all come back with something slightly different. So this is really an art. There's a lot of gray in the trust and estate world. You know, there's a lot of where you, there's a lot of 
uh, you know, what's reasonable compensation? What's, you know, what is, what are these implied, what are these, what, you know, and so you have to look at case law, you have to look at, there's more than just the governing instrument. So read the entire document from beginning to end. Um, I'm just curious, yeah. how often do you think that occurs before someone decides if they're going to agree to be the trustee, that they have actually spent that kind of time uh, and energy going through the document and having the conversation with counsel? It depends. If you're a professional trustee, so then you, I, I'm going to re, I'm going to say, for those of us in the room that are professionals, tr professional trustees, that we always do it. Okay. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> you always read the, the instrument, and you always look at, besides the instrument, who are the beneficiaries? Who, what are the assets of the trust? Oh, it's closely held business. Oh, it's, it's an orange grove. Oh, it's a um, manufacturer of artificial Christmas trees. Do I have the ability as a trustee to manage those assets? Because it's not just the governing instrument and the beneficiaries. OK, check the box, check the box, I'm good, I'm good. Now we're talking about the assets of the trust. Do I have the ability? You have to, and if you don't, that doesn't mean you necessarily not accept the role. But you need to know what the assets of the trust are, and then, and then your ability, because under prudent, the Prudent Investor Act, <clears throat> which was, prudent man rule is gone, guys. Prudent man rule is gone. So Prudent Investor Act um, was uh, adopted by New York in 1995. 1995 is new in the trust world. <laughs> um, uh, and, it's, and you have one of the precepts, there are four precepts of the new Prudent Investor Act, which guides trustees in making decisions regarding the management of their investments. One of the basic precepts of the Prudent Investor Act is the duty to delegate. Now in the old, what does that mean? That means I have a duty. If I'm a trustee and I don't have the, the ability, the investment, or the ability to manage an orange grove, but that yet the orange grove is in my trust that I'm trustee of, <clears throat> then I have a duty to delegate that responsibility to someone who does have the ability to manage that asset. Now, it's incumbent upon me as trustee to do the due diligence on that advisor. And it's not a one and done. So you do deep due diligence, and, and fees do matter. <clears throat> and who they are and their experience. So now let's say I'm good. I've delegated this responsibility. It's not a one and done. You have to continually monitor that person or that investment manager. This happens a lot with investment managers. Well, you know, I, I don't know anything about hedge funds. I don't know. Okay, that's all right. But you have to do due diligence and you have to continually monitor because what you, you can delegate the actual investment management or the management of the assets, but you cannot delegate the responsibility. So that is, that is a big difference. You're still on the hook. You can delegate the, the management, but you cannot delegate the, the investment, the uh, responsibility. Um, and, and the other thing I would say is to know that <clears throat> you know, the, when you're reading the instrument, let's say you've read the instrument and you're, you have check, 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 you've checked the box, you know who the beneficiaries are, um, you've, you've gotten to know them, you're, you're comfortable serving as trustee for these multiple people in your family. Um, know that um, the dynamics are going to change in the family, okay? If you're sitting at the table at Thanksgiving and with your sisters and brothers and brother-in-law and all of a sudden something is said from across the table, are you talking to me now as a trustee or are you talking to me now as my brother? See, so this is because <laughs> I'd like you to segue now into 
considerations when you're choosing the trustee beyond the professional trustee who's part of managing the family office. Yeah. Um, talking more about those relationships, the, the roles and dynamics in the family, and what are some of the common pitfalls uh, in terms of choosing trustees? Well, I think that, um, see, the cards went away, so <laughs> this way. <makes, laughs> um, the, the common pitfalls in choosing trustees is that I think what I've seen a lot over the last 33 years um, is that clients, you know, they, they they want to get their estate planning done. They want to get their, their, their planning done. And a lot of planning is done for tax purposes. If you ask clients, what, what, what was your intent in creating this grant? What was your intent in creating the, this document or that document? They, they will likely say, mm, I don't know. My attorney said, or my Susan at EMM said, or, um, or they might say, well, yeah, I'm saving a lot on estate taxes. Mm -hmm. And then we get into a discussion more about but the intent of the gift, because there's been a gift made. And so a lot of people, they want to get these things done, and they get to the selection of trustees, and they say, I don't know who to, you know. And so there becomes a discussion, and, they, and sometimes it's they put someone in, and it's sort of a plug person. It's someone in the family, um, oftentimes, you know, what I've seen as well is uh, sometimes they don't, they don't want to pay someone, so someone in the family is serving, you know, for free, um, and, you know, they'll just, they'll just get the guidance from the lawyer, but, but, and, uh, but the problem is, is that they're actually executing. I often say, I just said it again this morning, attorneys draft, I execute. I'm often in the seat of trustee. So oftentimes, the selection of trustee is sort of this sort of throwaway thought or afterthought. There's not a lot of, there's not enough thought into who are my, what are they gonna be doing? These are my governors. These are the people making the decision. They're power holders. They're gonna be over this entire trust and making decisions um, and thinking through these things. And and uh, what, I, what I really, um, it's disappointing when you hear, well, to me it is, it's when you hear <laughs> parents say, well, I'm making each children trustee over the other child's yeah. trust to keep them all in shape, in square, you know, so nobody gets away with anything. I'm like, oh boy, that is a recipe for disaster. So now you've got siblings over other siblings' trusts, and it was done to keep everybody honest. And um, so uh, if my client absolutely insists on doing that, I often will tell them, you know, the, the, there might be a better solution here. Um, and that's the balancing of, uh, if it, you know, is adding a co-trustee. So I'm not, again, I'm, not a, I'm not opposed to family members at all. I think family members as trustees often add that element that we as professional trustees don't know the dynamics or we know just one element within the family. We're not family. We're not family members. So if you pair up an individual family member as a co-trustee with a professional trustee, I think that dynamic works really, really, really well. Why? Well, for one, let's say you're the individual trustee and you think about your family and you're at that Thanksgiving dinner and your brother-in-law comes to you and says, you know, why aren't you giving my wife a distribution? You're like, oh my God, this is not an appropriate conversation for dinner table conversation. Okay, and then you can just say, I don't know, call Susan. <laughs> <laughs> you put it on the professional trustee. Just, you know, you can just, it's like, ends the, typically ends the conversation. Now, you know, I'm being very succinct because we're, we're here today and we have like 20 minutes, but. Um, that often works. And I, okay. <laughs> and I'll get, sometimes I'll get the call beforehand. Oh my God, I'm going to see these, you know, I, I know there's going to, or, uh, and, and it, it's a great team. It ends up being a great team because that individual family member trustee feels like an out. They, they have a bit of an, they still have the power, you know, it's a, it's a partnership. 
I'm just saying that that often makes an, uh, a great partnership because then they have a bit of an out. I don't know. Call Susan. Um, she knows, um, and uh, you know that that often works. And then there's that separation between family and you're you're just not making a distribution to me because you've had this grudge against me since since we were 10 you pushed me off my bike you've never gotten over it whatever it is right and um, that that's tough it's really tough because one of the duties of being a trustee so beyond the document you need to know that there are there's state law and common law there's a body of law called statement of the law third, restatement of the law third, um, there are basically, f there's 14 duties and powers of a trustee under law. These are not delineated in the trust documents. So beyond the trust documents, there are default provisions that would apply, okay, that you're not going to, you're not going to know, you're going to read the document and say, well, that wasn't in there. What, what, you know, I, I didn't know I was a fiduciary as a trust protector. It doesn't say that. I'm, I'm not the trustee, I'm just a trust protector, you know? Well, yeah, but did you know that the default provision under Delaware law or Pennsylvania law, naming a trust protector is that you are a fiduciary unless expressly uh, stated in the GOT document that you are not one. So these are the things you have to know. You are a fiduciary and you, you can just assume you're a fiduciary unless it's in the document that you're not. <clears throat> okay, back to these duties and powers. There are, there are 14 duties and powers, but there are basically two powers, the duty of loyal loyalty and the duty of care, and everything else emanates from those two duties. Um, and those two duties, duty of loyalty is the duty of unselfishness, the duty to avoid conflicts of interest, um, and... Um, lots of other duties, but it's basically overall this duty of loyalty. Now, totally different than acting on a board in your board fiduciary capacity. No, 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 no. This is a cat. This is fiduciary with a capital F. This is the ultimate gold standard when you serve in an individual or even a professional corporate tr trustee. Fiduciaries for individuals and families, it's the ultimate gold standard. What do I mean by that? Okay, the difference between serving as a fiduciary on a board versus a fiduciary of individual trust for beneficiaries. One, the fiduciary of a board is you have to, you have to serve as a, your fiduciary in the best interests. Okay, or best interests of shareholders or best interests. Over here, if you're a fiduciary in as a gold standard of individuals um, and the trustee individual families, that is sole interest. Okay, one is best interest, one is sole interest. So, what does that look like? Well, it's really difficult to be impartial sometimes if you have a relationship, since you have a relationship with your brother or sister. I mean, we're human beings, so we're gonna have opinions. We're gonna have feelings. And, and it, it is really difficult if somebody's just said something nasty to you and you're their trustee to take a step back and check yourself. Because if you, you have the power over them to make distributions or not make distributions, and then all of a sudden, if they think you're not because you had that argument last week, you know, you don't want to be deemed being what they call in court arbitrary and capricious. Um, and then all of a sudden, you're defending yourself. So it's really hard to be impartial and have this duty of loyalty. But it is you have to you have to always always do what's in the sole interest of the beneficiaries, <coughs> not best interests. Um, and the other is duty of care, uh, you know, that, that there's, that's communication with beneficiaries, which is a huge, um, this communication, that's accounting, that's being transparent, that's um, managing the assets prudently, um, 
So how does the beneficiary know that this is all happening according to plan, that they're getting the proper reports, that the investments are being properly managed? How does this play out? Well, I would say if your trustee, if you're a beneficiary, if your trustee is communicating regularly with you, if they are, um, let's say you have um, quarterly investment meetings and the beneficiary is part of those conversations. So communication is key. Are, as a beneficiary, are your, are your calls being answered timely? Is there, have there been any, have there been any, um, you know, late, have there been any claims or if there's, has there been any mismanagement? Has there been any, what, it, what is the, you know, what is the performance? Because UPIA is not about, that's Uniform Prudent Investor Act, it's not necessarily about performance, about, it's about conduct. I would ask the beneficiary, do you, do you have an investment policy statement? Has the, has the trustee sat down with you and discussed the, the nature of the assets and, and what your needs are as a beneficiary? Um, and so, you know, there needs to be communication. Oftentimes I get a call. The, the calls I receive are when things have gone bad is where some, the trustee or the executor has, has stopped, either stopped talking to the beneficiary or they feel they're, they're, they, they're not talking. Um, oftentimes that happens in the beginning when there, there, there are trusts and there's no communication and the beneficiary has said, you know, we, what, what, are, what are the nature of the assets? What's the plan? What's, what's the timeline? What, are we going to receive any distributions? Um, what, are, what, are, what can we expect? Um, and there's either no response or it's very just, this is vague, um, you know, and so it really is around keeping the beneficiaries informed, having regular quarterly meetings with them. Um, <clears throat> look, if they don't want quarterly, then you know, twice a year. Um, there are some legal uh, requirements for informing beneficiaries as well. So, um, you know, having them informed annually uh, is, and whether you want to do that to to literally what we call account. Um, is, is one way, but um, you know, sending, keeping them informed of the nature of the assets, the distributions, the principal distributions, the income distributions, like sort of the operations. And I have an article that um, I think everybody might have about the uh, responsibilities, risks and responsibilities of the trustee. And there's some guideposts in there as well. So I, I, I think that you know, there would be, that those are kind of, um, you know some of the things to look out for. Um, if you and if and thing is, you know, if the trustee continually, um, there are things that happen, particularly in families, that you know, what what if the trustee is wanting to buy an asset of the trust? Um, you know, is there? That, that sort of flies in the face of duty of, of loyalty. You, that's a conflict of interest. We try to avoid conflicts of interest all the time. I mean, at any, you know, you just try to avoid those conflicts of interest. Um, even if there is a arm's length, you know, my, my point is don't try to convince yourself that the price was fair when you as trustee bought that asset from the trust. Yeah, that's no, not gonna work in court. Um, particularly here in New York, um, and so you need if you're if somebody's going to do that. For instance, let's say the beneficiary found out afterwards that the that their trustee bought the asset, whether they're family member or not. Mm -hmm. um, let's say they, they found out afterwards that that they that the trustee bought an asset of the trust, and the the trustee's defense is, well, the price was fair. I had an appraisal. You know, and nobody was buying this property, so I bought it. So um, that is a problem. What the trustee should have done is gone to all the beneficiaries and gotten their consent in advance. 
um, is things like that, that you know, all of a sudden you know, people start to lawyer up. <laughs> and you want to avoid that because then all of a sudden you know, we've seen trusts where you know, people lawyer up and then they're suing each other. And, and the assets of the trust <clears throat> can really dwindle quickly because then through litigation, then, through litigation and, then, <laughs> and then it becomes the psychological dynamic of you know <clears throat> the need to be right and um, that's a that's a, you know there, there's if some, you want to be right or do you want to win um, and and that's that's a, that's so tough. do you see this more with the family trustees it's more likely to occur well, not that need to be right. Uh, uh, between family trustees, yes. Um, I sometimes, you know, when I when um, so before before coming to EMM, I was national head of trust and states for BNY Mellon, and and be, and spent most of my career really managing bank trust departments, and. You know, I ha this happens at the corporate trustee level too. So I can't say that this is perfect in one, as one area or the other. Where I've seen things go wrong, and many of you in the room have worked for corporate trustees as a trust officer, and you've, I'm sure you've seen it. And, and again, it's that communication. Get the, get the clients in the room, talk about it, talk about it, talk about, answer their questions. Don't let the phone you know, don't you? You know, you want a problem? Don't answer their call. And <laughs> you want a problem? You know, don't don't think that they may, don't. You know, let them think they're not important. Um, and that's where all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, Dad put all this in trust. The bank is the trustee. I don't even know these people. And by the way, I'm really pissed <coughs> off that my dad left this in trust and not outright to me. <laughs> And so, you know, you have that, so it's like gas on the fire, and the way to, that I found really helpful as a professional trustee, but individuals can trust, do this too, but again, it's easy, much easier with the help of, of, a, of a professional, is to get the beneficiaries in the room, answer their questions, have an understanding, let's say you have a co-trustee, make sure you're on the same page, with the co-trustee, you're doing this, I'm doing that, we're doing it together, um, and I would say put that, put those, put those things in writing, and continually communicate, and um, you know, and have that open discussion. Because what I found is that even in those really difficult conversations, why did Dad do this to me? Sort of conversations. Why? What was the intent of this? Why do we have this other trust? What is this? Um, is that <clears throat> it's, I look at it as um, I'm helping them understand their, it's an education. They may, not, they may not understand all the benefits of a trust. So if I'm able to run through a list of this is actually good for you, here's why. You know, creditor protection, um, you know, uh, there's all sorts of things. There's, you know, the estate tax. Um, yes, that was. Or these are these are you know these are structures that are they they may or may not be good for them. But it, it, depending on depending on the uh, the 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 trusts, you know, you're there. You're gonna you're educating them on the the values the value of the trusts and who's responsible. And I think I found that being you know once that transparency is there. Um, which may take a few conversations, you know, then, then it, it really helps the relationship because it's a relationship. It's not just like that, that, that there's this cold-hearted trustee with all this power and then the beneficiary has no power. And I'm curious, how often do you see these conversations in education taking place as soon as the trust is being drafted so that people are aware from the beginning of why this is happening and what and and the person who's creating this is still alive to communicate why they're doing this, their motivation and their vision. 
Never. Okay. Never. <laughs> okay. And I just get it being and what really would bold. You recommend? <laughs> uh, I don't see those conversations. That there's usually that's a really what I see more often is uh, it's really tough for uh, the oftentimes I shouldn't say never. Uh, it's really tough generally for um, parents to talk about the wealth and why, why they're creating these different trusts. Because again, I go back to if I even ask the, the, the creator of these trusts, what was your intent? The answer most of the time is, oh, I saved a lot in estate tax. Mm -hmm. And um, do your, what, what's your intention for, what's your intention for the, the you know, your kids? Um, with with the with the money with this with the the funds, um, well I don't you know um, it it really isn't a discussion about intention and so what we're seeing now is something called um, that it sort of evolved because of this problem is um, something called letter of intentions mm -hmm. and that's really helpful that's a that's a side letter. Um, and that is some people call it letter of wishes, um, and it's the you know dear Susan, um, this is this is how we don't want to put our values on you. We don't want to tell you how we how to live your life. Our family has values. These are our values. You know we don't steal. We don't you know we have value of charity. Charity is big. Um, for us, um, living, uh, living the Jewish life, and this is what this means to us. This is, and and that's really it's 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 not, you know, uh, it's not a distribution schedule. It's not legal terms. This is really a letter that is um, used by clients to to talk about the intention of how they would like that person to. You know, use the money and why they, why they. Uh, so that's the, you know why, why they've set these trusts up, um, and I, I see more and more clients really appreciating that. Um, I think there's a, you know, that there's an old dynamic. There's a generation that, you know, you just didn't talk about money. Absolutely. You just didn't talk about it. So that generation is, is. Um, changing a bit and so we have a new generation coming in um, that shift from that the World War II generation or before to uh, and, it, and it is funny you know it's uh, there uh, you know if clients say well I don't really want to talk about this with my kids I haven't talked to my kids about our wealth I haven't um, I don't want them to become entitled I want them to they, those are all Things, yes, With just a important. lot of stigmas around. Yeah, talking. a lot of stigmas. I can still remember my grandmother saying, it's vulgar to talk about sure. money. And if you don't have money, what is there to talk about? So <laughs> it didn't matter where you were. If you basically didn't talk about money. Right. But, so more and more people are gradually, you know, they're, they're asking us, well, how do I start the conversation then? How do I start these conversations? And that, that is a process. Um, because uh, we know, you know uh, that you want to prepare the heirs for the wealth, too. And I often say to my clients, oh, that, you know, they don't want to talk with their kids about money. I say, well, there's this thing called Google. <laughs> You know, and, not a big and so anymore. it's not a big, you know, they can find out through muckety muck. They can find out, you know, muckety-muck.com. If any of you haven't done that, put somebody's name in and it's you'll amazing. see, the, you know, it's, uh, there's all sorts of ways to figure out. And what I see is, is oftentimes by, you know, I'm not suggesting you disclose your balance sheet to your kids. It has to be age appropriate. Right, um, there's a time and a place for that, and I'm I'm that's I'm putting that there's that philosophy, and then there's the legal ramifications and restrictions around that. You might be required if you're trustee that so that 
there's these requirements as well. So you have to balance those two things out. But your question was about the intent and uh, or the creator in talking to, to children about wealth. But you know, yeah, they, they'll find out. They'll figure it out. The best thing is uh, to have healthy attitude and healthy conversation around money and wealth. And so we well, you st well the creator is still around. Yeah, yeah, and they can be difficult conversations. And sure. so um, I'm often pulled in to. Um, not necessarily mediate, but just help facilitate those conversations. That, that's often helpful. Um, it's a rare instance. Um, I've seen it a few times where uh, that, that sort of World War II generation has been completely transparent. Um, those, were, those are sort of pioneer people um, that, that you know, are completely transparent. Um, with their children, right. and uh, and so, yeah, you know, you, it it just I think that the letter of intention, letter of wishes, and if any of you want a sample letter of wishes or letter of intention, okay. let me know, and you could email me, and I could send you a sample of you know these are, but those things should be also coordinated with your lawyer, and because you don't want something completely different in their right. letter of wishes. No, something really holistic yeah. that, that yeah. brings the structure and the tax element and then the intention all together. And I right. think that's great advice. Yeah. And maybe now let's segue over to Andrew, um, who can tell us a little bit more about the responsibilities of the trustee uh, in a charitable foundation uh, or even on serving on the board of a public charity, because of course many of these families get asked all the time by numerous, by friends to serve on their foundation, by <laughs> local and national charities to serve on their boards. What are people getting into? Great Besides, question. it sounds like prestigious, <laughs> right? It's a complicated question in many respects, but it's actually a relatively simple one. Um, you know, I, I try to tell everyone to keep in mind right from the get-go whether you're talking about the family foundation or you're talking about the you know, uh, large national charity, domestic, international, it really doesn't matter because those the distinctions you're usually going to find are really tax distinctions in terms of classifications. But with respect to your resp responsibilities, it has nothing to do with that. Your responsibilities are more or less the same. The, place you're going to see differences are typically was the entity set up as a trust or a nonprofit corporation. I won't spend a lot of time talking about trust because frankly in the nonprofit foundation world you just don't see them very often anymore. Okay? Most people have kind of figured out that, you know, Delaware nonprofit corps whether you're a foundation, a public charity, whatever is usually a better route for a whole lot of reasons we won't get into, which is the second part of this, and that is, is you have to remember that state law is going to be a big driver of this, and hence the reason for the Delaware as opposed to New York, um, which leads to the next point before I uh, even get into the, what those typical responsibilities are, and that is, is you always got to kind of remember when you are in the philanthropic world, who am I worried about? In other words, if I'm a, a member of the board of directors of this thing, who's going to complain? Who's going to knock on my door and going to hold my feet to the fire? This is different, right? Susan, you're, you're, you're a professional trustee, and you have kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, who at any given time are going to come knocking on your door, pounded with their lawyer in tow, right? Here, it's different, typically, OK? Here, you still could get that, but that's rare. Here, the party who's usually going to knock at your door is located way downtown. That's right. It's the attorney general of New York, or it could be of any other state. Okay? It may be the IRS, but in my world, in my experience, the IRS is usually the last one to knock on your door. Okay. I'll go one step further to say, especially if you're in the um, public charity space, 
before the AG knocks on your door, it may be a reporter. <laughs> That's very true. Okay. I got called by a reporter just yesterday about something. Okay. <laughs> uh, because the truth be told uh, is that, you know, um, prosecution resources are, are somewhat limited and there's lots of opportunities for reporters to make great names for themselves. And that leads me to the, when I sit in a boardroom and I sit in probably no less than 150 board meetings a year, it doesn't matter who's at the table. When a question comes up, the question that I'm being asked is never, Andrew, is it legal? Can I do this? Should I say, no, we can't do this? In the real world, that's not the question being asked. The question being asked is, if I vote yes or I vote no, is my picture going to be on the front page above the fold? And will I be happy to see it there? Hmm. That's human nature. It's human instinct. But that being said, at the end of the day, what's going to drive that are the same legal fiduciary duties that everyone has. And in the real world, I like to boil it down to four very simple things. And I think most people uh, you know, who work with nonprofits will do the same. And it applies, again, remember, I don't care if it's a public charity. I don't care if it's a trade association, a uh, social club, or your small family foundation. Okay. Duty of care, what does that mean? Pay attention, show up, attend your board meetings. You have a private foundation, when's the last time there was a board meeting? Don't anybody answer. <laughs> okay, how many people here either currently sit on the board of an organization or previously sat on the board of an organization? Okay, very good. Don't answer the next series of questions either. <laughs> How many of you received a package of materials at least a week in advance of the board meeting and read all of the documents before the board meeting? Okay? Don't <laughs> anybody <you're> answer. <laughs> okay. <I'm, clears throat> okay. Duty of care. It's very hard to exercise the duty of care if you're not reading every one of those documents in advance. I find it amazing when I sit in a board meeting and we have a discussion about the budget, okay? So the CFO is making a presentation. Here's the budget. It's 12 pages long in eight-point font, okay? <laughs> I don't care how great your vision is. You're still, like, practically kissing the paper to read it. The presentation's over. They say, any questions? Dead silence. How can that be, right? Okay, now I'm, I'm you know, being a little uh, pushy about this at all, but think about this. These are your fiduciary duties, okay? Make informed decisions. It's hard to make a, an informed decision and approve that budget if you didn't spend the time to read it and understand it. Now, that being said, similar to Susan's comment earlier about uh, duties of delegation, as a member of a board, you can delegate, okay? And there's a whole process for doing that, but even still, Part of that delegation requires you to actually follow up and ask questions in order to ensure that your delegation was effective and good, right? And can you delegate the responsibility? To somebody else or to oversight it? No, you can't delegate a fiduciary responsibility. But I could delegate the responsibility to a CFO to go create a budget and to an accountant to go and audit that budget or the finances, absolutely. And that delegation is perfectly acceptable. You've met your duties as long as the person you've, or firm you've selected is uh, reasonable. You, uh, they have the reasonable qualifications. And you periodically check in to make sure that they are actually executing. Okay? You don't need to be a genius. You don't need to be a financial advisor. You don't need to be a CPA. But you do need to pay attention to what's going on, ask questions, and follow up. Okay? Duty of care. Okay? Duty of loyalty. This is the conflict question that everyone thinks about, okay? Does it mean I have to be the perfect altruistic board member? No, but it does mean you can't go and use your position to your personal benefit, right? You can't, you know, you can't use your position to get your spouse uh, or your partner 
hired by the organization to get paid. That doesn't mean they can't get hired and get paid as long as it's fair and reasonable. Okay? Big misnomer. Everyone says, oh, you know, I can't do any work for the, for the nonprofit. Think about how many nonprofits each of you have ever seen that was a startup. Almost every t startup will have as its primary service providers, lawyer, accountant, run down the laundry list, will be someone who is related in some way to the founders. And more often than not, they will provide their services either at a, at a modest fee, a discount, or some other sort of such relationship. Technically, those are still conflicts, okay? It's a big misnomer. But you can't use your, your, your role for the benefit, okay? The next two duties. I just duties. want to jump in for a second. As the organization matures, though, and is more in the public eye, sure. what would you say purely about the optics, not the legality, but the optics of that and, and how both the trustees and the organization should think about those conflicts? Goes back to the very first comment I made about how to, how, what is a question really asking when it comes to me in a board meeting? How's my face going to look above the fold on the front page of the paper? To your point, is it optically acceptable to see that the chair of the board is also the lawyer for the organization charging you know, their standard hourly rates? It might not look so great. Right? But then again, tell me that that person has unique experience you know, expertise and skill that you're not gonna ordinarily find elsewhere, maybe it's okay, right? You gotta balance that. At the end of the day, an organization is gonna survive based upon its ability to drive revenue, whether through donations, fee-for-service model, or some combination. If the general public rejects the idea of seeing the chair of the board getting paid by the organization market rates, then your donations go away. And you have to weigh that, okay? Um, it's not an easy question, and there's no right answer. I see it both ways, okay? But you really have to think that through. But from a pure legal perspective, it may not be illegal. Now, interestingly enough, uh, if you are a New York entity, New York Corporation, nonprofit, you will be required to jump through an extraordinary number of hoops as a board in order to legally proceed with that type of a relationship. The most recent uh, you know, Nonprofit Integrity Act that was enacted in New York changed the rules regarding conflict of interest. And there is a very significant list of steps you must take in order to hire anybody at any price, even at a discount, and meet the obligations uh, imposed under New York law. Okay? New York law doesn't really think about, is the service being even provided at a discount? You could charge a dollar for it, and you need to comply with the New York laws. It's very stringent, and it's almost not worth the bother, uh, is what most organizations would usually say. Sure. Amazing question. So it depends on who you would ask. The, the New York Attorney General's office has at times taken the position that a Delaware nonprofit doing uh, authorized to do business in New York will need to abide by, by uh, those rules. I would tell you the answer is no. Um, for those of you who follow uh, you know, changes in the law. Uh, to Susan mentioned the restatement of law for uh, trusts. Many of you probably don't know yet, but we just voted to approve a brand new restatement of the law for charities and nonprofits. That just happened a couple of weeks ago. I'm one of the advisors on that. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so that will be coming out in the, rest in the updated restatement. Uh, we have 
for the most part, uh, rejected the extension of what's called, what you're referring to as home rule, meaning that it's the Delaware AG that will enforce Delaware law on the nonprofit board of directors. So we've said no. And all, uh, the, the couple of New York lawyers that are advisors on, all were pretty vehement about that one. Okay. Uh, same th uh, is true for the California lawyers, because if you think uh, New York's bad for incorporating nonprofits, California's second worst. So, uh, so that's a rule. Um, but the last two fiduciary requirements, very quickly, uh, a lot of people don't think about it or realize them, but they are actually extraordinarily important. First one, duty of obedience. Don't anybody answer this question. How many people who have or do sit on the board of a nonprofit have read the corporate charter and all amendments, read the bylaws, in its current form, along with all of the corporate policies applicable to the organization? I meet very few people who can honestly say yes to that question. <laughs> However, the duty of obedience simply means honor the documents. It's amazing. CEO of any major corporation probably knows the following rule. Don't ever, ever have a policy if you are not prepared to live by it. Guaranteed way to get yourself into trouble. Nevertheless, when you shift over to the nonprofit community, uh, be it a private foundation or otherwise, we forget these rules, okay? But they apply, okay? And they can get you into a world of trouble. Where does that come up? How many people can think of a nonprofit board that suddenly had a power struggle? I'm hearing the laughs. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Those things get ugly. Well, Lord knows that when there's a power struggle, everybody's pulling out the charter. Everyone's pulling out the bylaws. Everyone wants to see. And to that Susan, your point, everyone's lawyering up. Yeah. OK? I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a call from someone who says, you know, I sit on the board of the Family Foundation, and we have a, a little bit of an issue around A, B, C, D. First thing I say is... A little bit of an issue. Yeah. <laughs> First thing I say, let me see the governing documents right off the bat. Okay? And then we start reading them, and we then have the discussion, well, how is the board elected? How do you decide to do this? How do you do decide to do that? And lo and behold, almost everything they do is completely opposite of what any of their documents say. Okay? Now we have real problems and a real basis to fight if we want to fight. Now, the truth be told, I tell everyone, find an agreement you don't want to fight because it will be extraordinarily expensive. But sometimes people want to fight for a while, right? Yep. Last duty I'll mention, very important as well. Some people will call it the duty of oversight or the duty of supervision. Okay? This comes up a little bit less so in the family foundation context, more so for sure in the public uh, charity. Okay? You need to oversight the management team, you need to oversight what's going on. Does that mean you need to know what all 3,000 employees of the nonprofit do? God, no, of course not. This goes back to the delegation, right? Who's on our management team? Are we oversighting what that management team is doing? Are they coming to us with good uh, reports in advance of the board meeting? Are they making sure we're informed? Are we assessing what they're doing? Are we asking questions? goes a little back to that duty of care, but all of these things apply. Um, think back to, you know, big stories in the media, you know, over the last, you know, 10 years. Nonprofits that have failed. Think about the opera. How did we get to that point with the opera? The opera. Right? Was the board actively paying attention to everything that was going on all the way through? You have to wonder sometimes, how do you get to a point where an organization fails? Okay? And I don't want to pick on the opera, and, I, and I'm sure many of the board members were being very attent attentive. Okay? I, I'm not 
Okay? But when things go badly, and they always will at some level, you have to go back and say, was I actively involved? Was the board proactive? You got to think about a nonprofit, and your, that includes the foundation, just like a business. Right? Think about how many times you've walked into a board meeting. It's a quarterly board meeting. And you spent more time talking about the color of the table linens at the gala than about, other, than about the other things that are, that, that are going on. So it's a challenge, OK? But that's where you get, frankly, you know, in my experience, to the point of making sure you have a strong management team. And again, this goes the same, whether it's a family foundation, a corporate foundation, or you know, an actively run nonprofit. Right? A strong management team of a well-run nonprofit will understand and know we need to go and talk to that board. We need to get in front of them. They're going to know what, what happens at a board meeting. Right? When you look around the room, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but not too much. When everyone's sitting there typing away on the BlackBerry, and you can hear the clicking. Mm -hmm. okay? You don't hear the clicking anymore now because everyone's got uh, iPhones and Androids. But you know, it's amazing. You know? Every, you know, half the people in this room has probably given some sort of a presentation in front of a board of some kind. So when you're in front of a group of people, you can kind of tell who's listening, who's not listening, okay? Who's scribbling away 100 notes and you know you're not saying anything that important. <laughs> where, you know, you know they're writing, you know, writing out the, you know, the, the shopping list you know, for, for ShopRite. I get it. And by the way, I've done it too, okay? I'm not perfect, okay? I'm not the A answer on the law school exam. Okay, but, but we strive, okay? And it's important because at the end of the day, you know, here's the thing. I remember the first time I was exposed to philanthropy. Now, I didn't know it when, I, when it happened. It wasn't until many years later that I realized what it was. I was probably, I'm gonna guess, roughly eight years old at the time, I was very close to my grandparents on my mother's side of the family. And that meant spending a lot of weekends uh, at their apartment, home. It's a little brown, tiny brownstone thing in Brooklyn. Okay, and I remember one Sunday, my grandmother is scrubbing the place top to bottom. My grandfather was out. It was just the two of us. Grandma, what are you doing? She says, I'm getting ready. What are you getting ready for? She goes, the woman from Deborah is coming today. What's that? Who, what do you mean? And my grandmother, understanding I'm a young boy, she's not going to explain anything too complicated. She goes, well, it's the woman of the charity that we help. I said, OK. Then I see my grandmother write out a check. Grandma, what are you doing? I don't know what a check is. I'm like eight years old. I know nowadays the eight year olds all know what checks are. Maybe if anybody ever writes PayPal. a check, they all PayPal. know Apple Pay. <laughs> I know they all know Apple Pay. Venmo. You know, Venmo, in store, <laughs> in app purchase, right? Uh, but at that age, you know, I was an idiot. I didn't know these things. I knew nothing. Okay. She goes, "Well, this is money." I go, "What's that for?" This is for the woman from Devora. Okay. Woman comes, and that's that. That's kind of the last of what I remember. I, don't, I barely even remember being in the room. I probably wasn't. My grandmother probably said, go watch TV in the TV room. Okay. Looking back on that day, I realized a couple of things. Ellen, can you remember the last time you met with a donor? And they already had the check made out. And they had the, well, yeah, they have to check it. Are you talking Long to in advance, manager? <laughs> you hadn't spoke to them, right? Think about that, OK? I ask people for donations constantly for nonprofits, OK? Nowadays, people are asking questions. What's your 990 look like? What are you going to do with my money? Is my name going on the wall? Da, 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 da. The line continues down. My point is. 
once upon a time, correctly or incorrectly, it was enough to simply say, we do good work. Support us. Okay? The law, in many ways, hasn't really changed. It was a bit, but the fundamentals haven't. Okay? What's different today, in many respects, is we had a 24-hour news cycle, a lot more reporters. We have an AG's office, in particular, in the state of New York, that many years ago figured out being an activist was a great way to advance my political career. Okay, which isn't to say they shouldn't be doing that. I'm not going to. That's not the point of my comment there at all, because the fact of it is, is bad apples in this community should be run out. I'm a firm believer of that. If you're doing bad things with a nonprofit, you're not doing what you should. Out, you belong out. It doesn't help anybody. One bad apple destroys it for everybody. It really it does. Ruins the trust. That's right. We also had. Foundations investing in Madoff. I, uh, yes. <laughs> and in the wake of that, uh, when the news was breaking, I sat in a newsroom, uh, yeah, downtown, talking about that. Um, and that's right. So, you know, it, it is a good thing that regulators do their job and hold people's feet to the fire, but it's equally important that not just as donors do we think to ask more widely. Well, uh, wise questions about impact and what's going to happen. We as board members, we as people who are going to be closely affiliated with a nonprofit, whether it's the foundation or uh, you know the the nonprofit that's doing the work, we need to be involved. And if we're not prepared to be, maybe you should just be an advisor. So, if someone is contemplating or has been asked to join the board, give me your top three things they should be asking before they nod and say, I would love to join your board? Uh, great. First and foremost, what are the expectations? Notice when I talked about the fiduciary duties, I didn't say anything about donating. You know, the give or get, OK? That's not a legal obligation, but it may very well be an expectation, and that's perfectly fine. More often it is. You need to understand what the expectations are. How often are board meetings hand handled? How proactive is the management team in incorporating us in the process of the organization? Do I get a package a week in advance? Is it well thought out? What does it look like? Okay. What do you want from us to be, to be involved, OK? You need to know that. It's important. Not just for you to know what is expected of you, but hopefully knowing what your fiduciary duties are, knowing that you do need to see things. You need to be proactive. You need to be involved, OK? It's a great balance when it works very well. Right? So that's number one. Number two, ask for documents. Get the corporate charter. Get the bylaws. Get the most recent financial statements. Okay? And if you see things that you don't understand, that's OK. Ask questions. All right? It's not an interrogation. There's nothing wrong with asking those questions. Frankly, you should. You should know about these things. Right? We're fundraising. Great. Are we in compliance with all of the different rules in fundraising? My goodness, that's one of these big catastrophes these days. I would say probably 30% of all my calls from nonprofits are because they're getting into trouble or have a problem on fundraising compliance. And we're not going to get into that. I could be talking for hours. Okay? But just know that fundraising is heavily regulated. And with today's technology and techniques, the laws weren't written specifically to deal with crowdfunding, peer-to-peer, -peer, et cetera. So you need to really know what you're doing, OK? Because if you don't, that liability is back on you. All right, so number two is the documents. And number three, understand who, who else is part of the team. Who else is on the board? Who is part of that management team? And get to know those people. Can you work with them? To Susan's point earlier about, you know, you know 
personal trusts, right? Communication. You need to be able to work with and communicate and be part of that team. If you're not going to be, then you're not going to be effective. You're not going to know what's going on, and it's not going to work so well. So those are my top three. Fantastic. Thank you. At this point, I'd love to open it up to, for some Q&A. Um, anyone? How expensive it is when you go to war. When you go to? Go to war. Ah, oh, the, the, yes, the family. Yeah, litigation or pre-litigation. Mm -hmm. What in your experience, when there are substantive grounds for a fight, but people want to find alternative ways of resolving it, what is your experience as to the best way to do so that does not involve major litigation between disputing parties? So, I mean, there's there are there's mediation, um, and you could there are some lawyers that also serve as mediators. So, you know, mediators are they're gonna they're gonna look to come to a solution rather than litigate. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, what they don't understand is that when they hire a litigator, um, often things can start, momentum will start, and all of a sudden it's sort of, that, that individual that hired the litigator, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but that it, that you, you might think, well, I can just pull that back. I can just stop the, all of this at any, at any time, and they're not going in with their eyes open. Uh, that, you know, you hire a litigator, you're going down a path that you may not be able to stop. It's boulder going down the hill. And um, so that's, that, that is, so, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, but what I would try to do is, you know, and, and by the way, you know, it, it may not be in the litigator's best interest to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> full, full disclosure, you know, it, that's how they make their fees. That's how they make their money. Um, no comment on whether that's good or bad. I mean, that's an ethics thing. But I mean, it's, uh, you know, that's, it, know what you're getting yourself into. Talk to, talk to a few pe other people. I will say that I, my, broadly speaking, trust in a state lawyers, uh, uh, the, our, a trust in a state crowd, we're pretty genteel people. We're pretty nice people. <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're, not the, we're not the fighting, litigating type. Um, there are a few trust and state lawyers that are, of course, or that are litigators. I and mean, it's not to say that, you know, I don't know which came first, you know, what, if they, be, they were litigators first and then became trust and state. But I'm just saying that trust and state planners generally are not the fighting kind of group of people. We're, we're a pretty genteel group, okay. Um, and it doesn't, there's, there's usually a lot of other options before you start litigating and going to court. Um, and so whether that's mediation um, and finding someone that, I mean, uh, you can talk things through, uh, whether that's a Someone like me, someone like Andrew, where you're saying, you know, what, what are, here's a situation. I, I do get calls from beneficiaries that they think that an egregious action has taken place by the trustee, and it's really not. Well, they, you know, no, wait a minute, what's, what's happening here? It's usually miscommunication. And then people, before they again start lawyering up, um, you know, it's usually around communication and trying to resolve those communication issues. Um, one party thinks that another person, because what happens is that then if there's no transparency, no communication, things are blown out of proportion. Um, so that's what I often try to get people to resolve before they start, start hiring their own lawyers. That being said, 
Sometimes that's the only way to, to go forward. That doesn't mean to hire a litigator. That may, might mean that the beneficiaries, to feel comfortable, they hire, they each hire their own l lawyer, and they feel like they have somebody um, on their, in their camp. Um, and depending on, you know, it, what, what's, what's can happen though in those situations, again, is that all of a sudden the lawyers are talking to each other, but the, there's no communication at the beneficiary trustee level. So it just, you know, you have to be careful, particularly with the litigation and try to, if there is a, if there is a situation that needs to be resolved, then um, hopefully, you know, the, the mediation is often the way to go. And um, yeah, yep. and I'll, uh, two, two things I'll, I'll add into that, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I get, like every lawyer out there probably, I get calls from all sorts of people asking me for referrals for all sorts of stuff, okay? And I always think about this question the same way I think about when somebody says, do you know anybody who does divorce work? And my first question always is, do you want somebody who's gonna be reasonable or do you want an absolute pit bull? I go, what do you really want out of the situation? To your point, you hire the pit bull, you're right. Once it lets loose, many times you can't take it back. Right. Okay? If you want someone who's reasonable, you're gonna forget somebody who's gonna try to find consensus, find a deal. Which brings me to my second point. And you know, so now I'll speak heavily you know, to the nonprofit community and the foundation world. I, my biggest warning to everyone is to remember, if you think you're gonna to head towards a litigation, number, two things are gonna happen. One's a possibility, depending upon who you are, the other's a guarantee. The possibility is someone in the media is gonna catch on and you're gonna be fodder for a long time. That's the possible. The guarantee is that at least one state attorney general will get in the picture. Yeah. And once that happens, as much as you think you can control the situation and as much as you think you are in the right, you're no longer in control. I know most everybody at the New York AG's office, as well as many others across the country. And despite knowing people, I will be the first to tell you, I can't control anything. Once it's in their hands, it is in their hands. And you need to really think that through. Okay. Other questions? I thought I saw hands. Hi. Thank you. That was that was wonderful. Really great discussion. Um, just a quick question on sort of the size of a nonprofit board, right? So um, I've seen even in the family foundation space or in the nonprofit space, sometimes you can have you know. 70 plus people on the board and when you start talking about you know sort of their fiduciary responsibilities right you could sort of be hard pressed to to sort of realize that all 72 people are really doing this like really is the, is their function primarily to fundraise and i just wondered if you had any thoughts around board size <laughs> to your point if you're on the board, you're on the board. You have all of those fiduciary duties. There are certainly, and I'm sure most people in this room could think of a number of nonprofits that have boards much larger than the 70s. Um, I have a client that is over, has over 100. <laughs> <laughs> Not my advice. <laughs> my advice is actually go the other way. Get it lower. Because most of these people on the board really don't, they're not exercising their fiduciary duties. To your point, they're there because um, they've made a, a very large uh, major gift and they've been invited onto the board and it is viewed as a place of honor and prestige. Right. Prestige. And, you know, to the point of, you know, the Madoff situation. You know, there were people who suddenly said, whoa, this isn't a good idea. My advice to every nonprofit out there that's thinking about 
either going in a direction like that or they're already in a direction like that, my advice typically is think about having a nice big discussion and create an ambassador program. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. But the bottom line is you want to make it clear that these people are not accepting roles as directors and picking up on those fiduciary duties. It's just, I find it challenging to understand how 100 plus people can exercise their fiduciary duties. I mean, it's just so hard to get consensus votes. It just, even with, a th even with you know, some of these organizations, you'll find you know, a 30 person executive committee. A 30 person board you know, takes a lot of energy to manage. It's possible, it's doable, but it takes real work. And some organizations are prepared to do that, others are not. Um, I'm not in favor, I just think it's too large. And by the way, there have been instances where the Attorney General has actually gotten involved to basically say, trim it down, or we're gonna, we're gonna intervene. Because the AG's office does have the right to do that. On the, on the individual trust side, I just want to make a comment. I, um, you know, the same, you know, same concept sort of applies. Um, be careful naming five family members as trustees, mm. as co-trustees. <laughs> Getting five people to agree is Funny. tough. It's really tough. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm doing that now. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's, uh, it's tough. Very bad. And, uh, uh, so that, that's just, you know, numbers of people that have the same power and um, there's, there, you know, what's their thinking on it. Um, so naming, again, getting, and then, then there's just the practical side of, um, you know, five people signing paperwork. I mean, talk about de a delay in getting things done. Um, and um, thank goodness an irrevocable trust is no longer an irrevocable trust anymore. <laughs> Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, you have, you know, you can possibly decant the trust now. Maybe you can do a non-judicial modification agreement, non-judicial settlement agreement. There's different uh, avenues now available to us to modify irrevocable trusts sometimes. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of trustees where there are five trustees. They say, you know, can't just one person do this? <laughs> can we just show up and you can... Uh, you know, yes and no, but uh, you know you can't you can't delegate, for instance, to you know just the brother and the family. You know, you, all the financial institutions. There's five trustees. I don't care what institution it is. If it's a financial institution in America, they're going to want all five trustees to sign the documentation, and that stuff takes a long time. And and they probably want it on their own forms. It's not enough to send them the trust document. Um, Elson, I worked for you know 30 years in financial institutions, so uh, you're you know it, it's a lot. And the the uh, so <laughs> just in talking it's about people with the power and their fiduciary responsibility. Absolutely. Would you recommend a corporate or bank trustee, or knowing that there are biases based on experience here, um, what are the pros and cons? of having a bank trustee versus a family member? Uh, I, have, I, act, I have something, if you want to see me after, I have something that um, I have with me that I can give you, and it's sort of like the pros and a quick, a quick one-pager pros and cons of individual trustees, sort of lay people, family members, corporate trustees, and then a professional trustee. And sometimes, you know, I hate to give you the typical, you know, lawyer answer of it depends, um, but it depends uh, on the situation. For instance, if you, um, you know, Delaware, Delaware trusts require bricks and mortar. They require a Delaware, somebody that's a resident trustee. Oftentimes, if you're going to have a Delaware trust, you're going to have, you're going to need a corporate trustee. So it depends on nexus, depends on a lot of things, depends on the nature of the assets. You have a lot of corporate trustees that um, don't want an operating business in the trust anymore. Uh, we used to, like 30 years ago, but a lot of banks are, corporate trustees are known as the deep pocket. 
meaning that they're often put in because, well, I'm just, you know, they're, they're the deep pocket, meaning when, when people get sued, they're going to get sued. Um, they're the deep pocket. And so, um, you know, uh, banks generally will settle with the beneficiary or co-trustee rather than, you know, go to court and have their name on the front page of the Times. Yeah, reputational damage is huge. You don't want that if you're a financial institution. So you're usually, those, a lot of those cases are settled out of court. But um, yeah, it, de it depends um, on the situation. There are um, conflicts. Um, and I'm not sure you know, if you're talking about investment products. You know, and, and so there's, there's nothing in the law that says you can't take a fee. Um, banks, court, you know, trustees, individual trustees, professional trustees, you can take a fee. Um, it should be reasonable. It should be disclosed. If, you're, if you never send a statement to a beneficiary, huh, you're not disclosing anything. <laughs> Your fee as a trustee can be taken, at, taken back, can be dis, you, you can be disgorged of your fees. You, all those fees could be returned. So, you know, it, it, it's, uh, that, that, is a, that is a conundrum. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's the double dipping on the corporate side that um, you, need to be, you, you need to ask about um, if you're a beneficiary or a co-trustee is, wait a minute, you're getting a fee for the, the investment product, you're getting a fee as trustee, and let them explain that to you. Um, and uh, it's not to say that there, it could be, you know, it, it's probably a, conver it's a conversation that needs to be taught, you know, it's a conversation. You need to talk about that. Um, and there are usually embedded conflicts everywhere. Um, you try to avoid the conflicts, um, but it, at best you mitigate against them. And full transparency is always the best way to go um, with, with co-trustees and beneficiaries. You don't want anybody saying, you know, like hedge funds, for instance, or bank products that are um, private equity, you know, sort of, it, in, in asking them, well, hold on a minute. This, I'm putting this investment in trust. Um, if we fire you as trustee and replace you with another corporate trustee, can I remove that investment product? Or do I have to sell it in order to leave your bank? This is not to pick on banks. Believe me, they're, you know, my friends. I still teach for the New York Bankers Association Trust School. So, um, you know, but the, these things, they, you know, can, do I have to sell that when I leave? Or can I transfer that to, you know, it's, I'm not, I can't answer that question for you because the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. But these are all the questions of, wait a minute, what is that product? What is that? Um, and make sure that there is, um, that it, well, the bank should be making sure really, if they're managing a trust and they are the trustee, they really need to have trust, people with trust experience, you know, on that, managing that. Um, so they're, they're, they're responsible and liable. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, one <laughs> quick last one, Elka. Just to overly simplify the answer. The only thing I would say is yes, that I, I, I always, I like to have, um, and you won't, you won't see this in older documents generally, but I like the ability of a gatekeeper on that. What do I mean by that? Well, I like to build into the documents in the drafting that the beneficiaries, either the beneficiary or by majority of the beneficiaries, have the right to remove and replace the corporate trustee. 
always. And by the way, corporate trustees have come around to this. Who wants to be in business with a beneficiary that doesn't want you? Okay, and the, one of the things that we always look at as professional trustees is do you have the ability to resign? Um, what's your out? What's the end game? And, but I always like to have, um, if there is a, a real plus in having a corporate trustee, for what, whether it's Nexus to gain ex, Nexus to South Dakota or Nevada or Delaware or, hey, this is my team, I trust them, I'm gonna have them with a, with a family member, um, things change. What is right for today may not be right in 10 years or 20 years, and trust can last a very long time. So you always want other people to be able to remove and replace trustees. That's right. my opinion on it. I think we're <laughs> out of time, folks. I just wanted to thank you all. Let's have a big round of applause for Andrew and Susan. This was fantastic. We, we could have gone on all morning, but I will tell you there's some excellent handouts on the table that Susan provided with some great tips. Uh, we'll be emailing you some excellent articles and, and more resources from both Andrew and Susan. And please be in touch with us, not only about your clients, your philanthropy, questions we can answer, but um, ideas for programs and speakers and things you'd like to hear. So uh, I look forward to seeing all of you again in the fall. Have a wonderful summer, and thank you. Thank you, guys.